to give the direction, to give the direction of my talk, uh, I would like to frame it um, with three theses uh, concerning finance. Um, first, a theoretical thesis. Um, um, the tradi traditional distinction between market and state, between politics and economics, is a liberalistic myth uh, that fails to capture essential aspects of modern governance. Such dichotomies have rather um, a limited explanatory value. Second, an historical thesis. The emergence of modern finance is inseparable from the formation of strong state apparatuses. More precisely, modern finance issued from an intimate symbiosis between government um, and private financiers. The financial system operates till now in a private public gray zone. And third, a political thesis, it is precisely the democratization of Western societies that has led to the immunization of certain sectors, especially the financial sector, against democratic control. With the financial system, we can realize the emergence of a, I would say, fourth branch, fourth power in government, which I will call the monetative. So the executive, legislative, judicative, and the monetative uh, power. At the end of the 17th century, <clears throat> a touching story set in the mid of 16th century was making the rounds. It refers to the fate of uh, Emperor Charles V and his private financiers. One version went something like this. On his travels, Charles V once made a stop at Augsburg. The Fuggers, known for their fabulous wealth, showed their deference to the emperor with spectacular hospitality. A bundle of cinnamon sticks, um, piece, uh, a spice uh, that, that was one of the most expensive commodities was hung in a fireplace. After the emperor had been shown a promissory note for a very significant sum signed by himself, it was burned just as the cinema sticks were ignited. There were now spreading a quote, a fragrance and a light, which were the sweeter and the more pleasant to the emperor, as by them he saw himself freed from a debt, which given his financial situation, he could only have paid with difficulty and which was in this way elegantly offered as a gift. Unquote. This anecdote published, do you understand my English? Uh, because I don't know what I'm speaking here. And, um, <laughs> okay, um, this anecdote published by the French art uh, theorist André Philippien in 1685 is probably a complete fiction. That is, uh, that it is nonetheless significant becomes apparent uh, in its correspondence to a number of related episodes. Similar tales are told of merchants from Genoa or Antwerp. The sums of money uh, vary considerably, but every time the story ends with the burning of the imperial uh, promissory note. However, conciliatory, this circulation of gifts to the benefit of the imperial coffers may appear, the spectacular gesture and the cancellation of debt merely make up the surface of these stories. The anecdote in particular presents an entanglement between financier and sovereign, the resolution of which tends towards the tragic comical. Aside from the fact that the story is fitting for a time in which the bankruptcies of the Habsburgs were proverbial, it presents a scene in which the prince and finance dynasty change position in a surprising manner. In the first instance, it evokes all those um, borrowed sums from bribes for the imperial election to the coast of his military campaigns that put Charles V in the debt of the Fugas and others. Meanwhile, 
the pyrotechnical turn reverses the political order. Burning cinema sticks demonstrate luxury and unproductive wastefulness. The burnt bill of exchange marks an early modern high haircut. And thus, the simple fact that the sovereign no longer owns credit. In the patrician abode, the emperor is confronted with the reminder of his insolvency and, is, uh, and his unfulfilled obligation, a move that must appall the sovereign. Sovereignty understood as independence, one-sidedness, and figure of last resort, renders the merchant's gift an act of usurpation. The merchant's gift um, suspends all reciprocity. It interrupts the circle of giving and giving in turn and marks a decisive asymmetry. While 17th, uh, while <clears throat> 17th century doctrines of sovereignty position the prince and his tre treasury as the ultimate creditor, the burnt promissory note itself claims the position of an ultimate but private creditor in the relationship between prince and finance capital. The emperor is given what is not the emperor's. He receives nothing which is what he owns. owns, owns. This is the precarious resolution, uh, resolution of the situation. In the Augsburg scene, the sovereign is made once more what he already was, that is, the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire by the grace of capital. The interest in this little tale lies in how the generous performance of the financier provokes a reverent, reverential confusion about where and in whom the position of sovereign power will be embodied. The anecdote reflects the difficult condition of public households in the Renaissance and their entanglement with contemporary finance capital. It articulates an irritation already apparent in the writing of early modern theory of the states and sovereignty uh, like Jean Baudin, Cardin Lebré, or uh, Charles Loiseau. For however, much, for however much these theories strain to convert a multitude of authorities and privileges into a unified political format and to define, I quote, a quote, the absolute and perpetual power of the commonwealth, the setting, the settling of fi uh, fiscal questions take, takes up a precarious place within them. On the one hand, coinage, tax collection, the budget, public budget are claimed as essential markers of sovereignty. On the other hand, they differ from other sovereign privileges, such as legislation or the right to pardon, in that they lead into a controversial and murky area made up by unclear responsibilities, peculiar considerations, complex decisions, incomfortable commitments. Question of coinage, for example, point to a sphere in which simony leaseholders, vendors, and hangers-on of all kinds threaten the erosion of sovereign state power. Permanent taxation conjures up with conflicts with private property rights, as well as concerns about the independence of princely households. Finally, the negotiation of a state budget on the basis of credit is accompanied by a, by a horror of its own kind. The absolute limit of absolute power comes into view. The cycle of loan and debt service, the servicing caused by credit, an evil that Baudin, for example, saw to originate with Francis uh, the uh, I, becomes the embodiment of political pathology. Um, it signifies, I quote, the fever of statecraft, the ruin of the prince. It marks the place where sovereignty's monop monopoly of, on power is undermined by economic dependency. Apparently, 
state finance raises a subject that challenges the theoretical development of early modern doctrines on sovereignty in a particular manner. It provokes inconsistencies and comes up against incompatibilities okay, with the uh, unified format of sovereign power. These difficulties appear to be due to the fact that the fiscal complex presents a key motive for the consolidation of early modern state power and at the same time marks its limits or fault lines. Fiscal manner, matters take up a critical position that resists resolution within a homogeneous idea of the political. With respect to two base elements, I want to show how early modern finance unfolds in close correspondence with political power, how along with it a strategic, tra strategic field in its own right emerges, and how this field appears as a political economic gray zone which does not fit into the established models of political power. These two elements are the idea of the treasury in Latin fiscus and the role of public debt or sovereign debt. First, Roman law already made the fiscus, this means the purse or the coffers, subject to complex differentiations that reflected the relation between private fortune and state assets. At stake were, quest at stake were questions concerning the rightful property of the treasury, relation between the treasury and the immortal entity of the empire. The treasury becomes a strange object, the status of which remains debated unclear or riddled with exceptions. So, as the, uh, the legal scholar, German legal scholar, scholar Otto von Gierke notes, in the Roman Empire, the fiscus caesaris, this means the emperor's private treasury, is consolidated with the erarium of the respublica, the state asset. In a certain sense, it is nationalized and yet remains subject to the rules of private law. It is precisely by its own nationali nationalization that the treasury models itself on an idea of personhood under private law and thus introduces a strange doubling in the form of imperial power. While the state as such elevates, as Kierke says, itself ever more decisively above the law. The state as fiscal entity, as treasury, subject itself to the law and goes as private entity among private persons." Unquote. At the same time, the private position of treasury was compromised by a whole sequence of exceptions which again mark a tension between private and public in the treasury itself. In some ways, it remained unclear who or what res publica, the emperor or a private person, was acting in the name of the treasury in Roman law. In the modern era, the steadfast link between treasury and state was, uh, is provable. Nonetheless, wavering regulations of this kind persist. For example, fiscal law is understood as emerging from the summum imperium and as a part of the superioritas. The treasury is in itself a mark of sovereignty and can be attributed to all sovereign authorities, princes, states, free cities in the same measure. The bearer of rights to national assets coincides with the subject of sovereign power, the treasury overlaps with the person of the sovereign. But pre precisely as a moment of sovereignty, 
The Treasury now vents the character of an independent and, I quote, personalized fund or estate. It becomes, as Skierke notes, an immortal and abstract conceptual being, a fictitious legal person which survives its changing representatives. It faces the sovereign as a sign of sovereignty and binds him to specific duties, for example, with the ban on the sale to state assets. The Treasury takes up an eccentric position and remains as a defining instance of sovereignty beyond the sovereign grasp. Where the Treasury is positioned in a contradiction to the ruler as private person, but also to the prince as a bearer of sovereign power, a distinction is also introduced in the fiscal realm itself. Here, some areas, like coinage rights, for example, are clearly assigned to sovereign power. Others, like mining or tolls, are subject, uh, subject to bare property laws, a peculiar combination or confusion between sovereign rights and private law. The division between legal state actions and plain business is provoked by the instance of the Treasury, yet made problematic at the same time. Items relating to the Treasury somehow belong to sovereign rights, but cannot finally be isolated from the activity of private businesses. Even Baudin renders public domains and national assets as bound to the status of the sovereign. They are, I quote Baudin, sacred, inviolable, and in a alienable, unquote. Nonetheless, fiscal authority cannot be immediately claimed as a marker of sovereignty if it refers to public assets as well as to the pri uh, prince's private property. And when, in the 17th century, the maxim, I quote, that only the sovereign prince has the right to a treasury, unquote, has established itself, it is just this prerogative that is immediately bound up with limited commitments and liability. One might say attempts to frame the problem of sovereignty in a monolithic way are pervaded by resistances that go back to fiscal matters and concern the issue of the fiscal objects related to them. On the one hand, treasury is allotted a domain of authority by virtue of essential marks of sovereignty. On the other hand, this domain immediately divides into distinct private and public tasks. It cannot or can only under great conceptual um, strain be associated with the unified form of sovereignty. On the one hand, the treasury takes shape as an impersonal, ahistorical, and non-transferable entity, a quasi-sacred object, which, like the sovereign, is placed above the law and marks as soul of the state a sphere of supra-personal continuity. On the other hand, the treasury creates an independent legal personality wherewith a tension between sovereign power and the sacred domain of finance unfolds. The quasi-eternal duration of sovereignty is made dependent on the quasi-eternal duration of the treasury. In this way, a process has been completed in which, as Ernst Kantorowicz notes, a decidedly secular entity like the treasury become or became numinous and is awarded the ability to represent the invincible aspects of prince and state. At the same time, um, cracks in the concepts of sovereignty power became apparent. Treasury, 
means the fiscus, or finance appear as scenes on which political power, business transactions, and private commerce are intertwined. Against this background, the special status of the treasury in early modernity is characterized by the way in which it coincides with the arcane domain of sovereignty and yet is situated as a sphere of action and power in its own right. This brings me to the second aspect. Since um, the Hundred Years' War, there is a record of vehement expansion of public or sovereign debt. Furthermore, the beginnings of public debt were bound up with the double concern of how royal houses might become reliable debtors and how the finances of the treasury could be secured in the long term. Dynastic succession did not, did not guarantee the acceptance of the debts of a predecessor. Conversely, the acquisition of monetary means in emergencies and wars was ever uncertain. Um, con uh, was ever uncertain. Uh, funding via raising of taxes and duties took the shape of an extraordinary confiscation, which could often only be enforced against resistance. In the uh, 16th century, at latest, a process began that um, contemporaries identified most clearly in the financial politics of Francis I, the French king who lost the ruinous campaign for the emperor's crown against Charles V. Three elements are commonly noted, even in the um, 16th century. First, interest-bearing loans were not used only for extraordinary expenses during times of war, for example, but also for the funding of running coasts, which led to the form for formation of private finance consortia. Second, payable interests were funded by indirect taxes on consumer goods like meat, fish, wine, and so on. And third, um, finance management was centralized. The income from private royal domains and from tax were consolidated in a unified treasury. Here, we can trace the emergence of a tax or financial state which is marked by a peculiar turn, and this is important in this moment, what was once exception, that is, the confiscation of in national emergency in war has now become an interior need of um, administration. With the link between national or sovereign debt and tax levy, the diktat of necessitas is installed in the center of the administrative architecture. This brings about two principal consequences. On the one hand, the increasingly steady demand for extraordinary capital must be recognized as the driving force behind the information of uh, early modern states and uh, the, the formation, sorry, the formation of early modern states and their bureaucratic apparatuses. One might put, his, put it in this way. Before a sovereign and eternal state power was acknowledged in principle, it was preceded by the idea of eternal debt in public finance. On the other hand, this form of national financing has mobilized the power of private capital. The permanence of public debt shown itself the richest source of private wealth, a significant process in which the antagonism between political structures and money capital as such collapsed. Emerging from these circumstances, 
were the most aggressive figures of early modern capital power. Let me just, uh, to end uh, this, um, this chapter, um, let me just mention one of the most prominent examples. As early as uh, 1148, the Republic of Genoa was forced to take up loans and their creditors united in societies which, in lieu of the payment of interest, were accorded the administration of various tax revenues. In 1407, a number of these societies were reunited in the famous Casa di San Giorgio, which provided credit to the government of Genoa until the 18th century. A consortium of private creditors was directly incorporated into the government of the Genoese Republic. Merchants claimed position of political administration. They controlled government incomes, state credit, and public finance. The Casa was allotted tax monopolies, mortgaged state property, ran army and na navy, waged wars, concluded contracts. It was awarded jurisdiction, colonies, and sovereign rights. In this way, Genio became, as Fernand Bordel uh, put it, Genio became the capitalist city par excellence, and the Casa was regarded as true state within the state. By the mid 15th century, the Casa had already become the most powerful financial institution in the Western world. Genoese bankers transferred ref, uh, returns from trade with good into government bonds. In the 16th century, they entered an alliance with Spain, pushed German mer merchants like the Fugger, for example, out of a credit business with Spain, organized the transport of Spanish silver to northern Italy, financed Spanish troops in the Netherlands, and dominated the money markets on fairs like Lyon, Besançon, Antwerp. The entanglement of socialized debt and privatized state income was the prerequisite for non-territorial networks with which Genoa dominated European banking and which allowed to serve as a prototype for a cosmopolitan agent of capital accumulation. I skip here one uh, very important uh, example, simply for um, uh, uh, not running out of time. Um, a very prominent business uh, model uh, the uh, Genius invented, the so-called asientos. Uh, these were contracts uh, to transfer um, the, uh, uh, the value of um, uh, South American silver to Netherlands uh, to finance the war in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting. Uh, the bankers financed the war, but also at the same time, the independence of um, uh, Netherlands from Spain. A very interesting um, 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 business concept. But uh, I skip it and um, come uh, slowly to the end. Um, the Spanish uh, imperial politics thus caused a private trade in bonds, trade in bonds, which was dominated by the genius bankers and resulted in a European financial market. If Genoa becomes emblematic for the formation of a capitalist world system in the Wallerstein's sense, then this is due to a politics of public loans and the attendant alienation of the state. Both the genius financial power in the form of the Casa di San Giorgio and the first international money markets come about thanks to the dynamic of state debt um, uh, and thus the interweaving of political action and private business activity. Let me conclude. Two settings, the treasury, so the fiscus, and public debt have shown how essential elements of modern politics and economy developed, especially in their zones of indifference. Modernity has not only brought forth sovereign state apparatuses, 
internationally operating trading companies, several um, uh, influential financiers, and decentralized markets. A particular type of power has taken shape, which can neither be adequately described via political structures nor via economic strategies. Instead, it is constituted solely by the work of the two poles within each other. With a view to the monetization of European econ economy since the Renaissance and the enrichment effected by fiscal money politics, we might define this power as seniorial power from seniorage, this means the profit by making money. It is set apart from the various modes of state power by the fact that it coincides neither with the institution of sovereign power nor with the government, but is instead based on the integration of private agents and entrepreneurial practice. It is a form of power that is tied up with the settings of political economic gray zones that come about in both the development of modern political orders and economic systems. A theoretical approach finds this area difficult because political as well as economic theories of, mod in, uh, of modernity are organized even for consistency via definitions of system, form, and structure. Political theory to this day is oriented towards a study of the form of political sovereignty. Economic theory looks uh, to the character of coherent, coherent functional systems. In contrast, the figures of seniorial power can neither be defined by the solidity of forms, the coherence of systems, nor the stability of structures. They make up, um, they make up ten, tends to be informal, unstable, stable, and is not translatable into a concise, systematic format. One might call this the situational interaction of forces of varied origin, the effectiveness of whereof emerges from, I would say, diagrammatic arrangements. Seniorial power can perhaps be defined by four features. First, this power is marked by a heterogeneous makeup in which the formation of capital power cannot be separated from the activation of power capital. The antagonism between state and capital is weakened, lifted, or simply not existent. The dominant position of the genius bankers in the Renaissance did not rest in the accumulation of private property, but in the ability to transform the political potential for action into business assets and vice versa. This conversion of state power into capital, and therefore the capitalization of power itself, is second tied up with fiscal operations. It takes place via the alienation of the state in the scenes of its emergence. A privileged example, the process manifests in the cultivation and management of public debt, which began in the North Italian city-states. Administrative pressure gets fused to the development of new platforms for business, the commitments of public loans are balanced by a permanent taxation, by means of which an apparatus of capture, in German Vereinnahmungsapparat, an apparatus of capture for populations is installed. By securing fiscal income, seniorial power aligns itself with the organization of the social field. So the fiscal debt, uh, sovereign debt, and taxation have the same origins and organize the uh, structure of the social field. Third, 
In this way, cycles of debt are initiated, which justify their description as original scenes of capital. If capital is understood as an expendable value amount that carries the promise of future profit, then the private management of public credit gives steady form to a speculative capitalist financing. Together with sovereign debt, modern fiscally, fiscality, which, as Marx notes, is funded on the taxation of the most necessary means of life, takes a decisive part in the capitalization of wealth. In them, the most, I quote Marx, an energetic lever of originary accumulation is manifest. With this regime of accumulation, the extraordinary has become the norm and the exception the rule. Fourth, this has led to a movement that is as effective as it is doubled. The extent to which the modern state is built on the making of permanent public debt and taxation is also the extent to which it has gained a quasi-sovereign fiscal power which, in its permanent state of emergency, withdraws from the sovereign grasp and which will take uh, later its institutional forms, for example, in central or national banks. This is how the pre precarious position of senioria power is constituted. Here, the privatization of public resor resources meets with the political occupation of private finance. It is just this reciprocal private-public incorporation that gives seniority powers its, its special position. With this fiscal side, it claims sovereign dignity as embodiment of private capital. It resists arbitrary political acts. The formation of sovereign state apparatuses in concert with business enterprise has put into motion a dynamic that manifests itself in the eccentric becoming sovereign of seniorial power. With the object of finance, next to and set apart from state authority, a domain of sovereignty has established itself that is of its own kind and will, as you know, have a great future. Uh, thank you for your patience.